So as we come to our time of worship, let us pray. Almighty God, you search us and know us. May we rely on you in strength and rest on you in weakness, now and in all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So welcome to our online service today. My name is Steve. I'm rector here in Stretton Parish. And I'm Chris, the Associate Minister. Good morning. Chris, I didn't get the memo about not wearing a collar. What's 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 the deal? Well, the, the deal is, Steve, that I've just got home from Church Stretton and we were taking part in the Holiday Club, as you were. Yeah. And uh, you've managed to have time to change and I haven't. We all had stripy shirts on. And uh, I seem to remember you had a rather fetching red bandana on. And that's why, and that's why your hair is sticking. standing up because I can't get it to lie down again. <laughs> Yes, great fun has been had on the first day of the Holiday Club. Um, lots of craziness and crafts and sports and um, yeah, learning about, do you remember, Chris? The story of Paul. So we are shipwrecked on an island. And so um, hence the bandana that I was wearing. Um, so we're pirates learning to change our ways. So um, yeah. Good fun. And that's kind of part of our family news. As a parish this week, we've been able to be reaching out into so many different ways. Teased to please last weekend as the community down at Little Strait and came together for good tea and cake um, and then holiday club this week. And then looking forward to Alpha um, starting in September. So that's one of our notices is Alpha is coming up. Uh, time to be inviting friends. And if inviting friends means that you need to come along, then great. Do sign up and make sure. Um, what else is there, Chris? New contact sheets out? Yeah, and uh, early bird details of the harvest celebrations at the uh, beginning of October. So do have a look at that if you want to take part in the harvest holdown. So um, get your ticket for that. So everything for that is all on contact and on the website. So make sure you have a read of that. But our reading today is from Matthew 16, beginning at verse 22. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will, for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is, is going to come to his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so Caroline, one of our retired clergy with PTO, is going to bring us today's talk, after which we have a time to respond with a song of worship. I've recently returned from an incredible holiday, sailing off the west coast of Scotland, and exploring a number of the islands. One highlight was visiting the island of South Rona, which is between Skye and the mainland. 
On the island, I walked across the church cave, which has been used as a place of Christian worship between the 1500s and 1912, when a new mission hut was built. But even then, until the 1930s, when the remaining population left the island, fathers would climb down the precarious cliffs to church cave to baptise their children in the natural font, a rock bowl fed by water dripping from the cave roof. It was a very difficult walk in, down and then up some very steep cliffs. And in places, it was really quite boggy. The notice at the jetty said it wasn't for the faint hearted. The cave is a bit like a cavern with an incredible arch. Inside, it ju does look just like a church with a series of natural stone seats and a stone pulpit. It was a beautiful place with incredible views and the sound of the sea below. It was a place that invited you to pray, to breathe, and like Iona, it's a thin place. Now, it's the beginning of September and the children are back to school this week. For many, there is a sense of life shifting, that back to school, back to work feeling. That sense of shifting a gear is also reflected in our reading from Matthew. Jesus and the disciples have been out in the Galilean countryside, enjoying the lake and the hills and going on long walks, learning lessons like how to feed 5,000 hungry people and despite the crowds, finding some time for themselves. Now they've travelled on to Caesarea Philippi, which is about 30 miles north. Here, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do people say I am? Peter replies, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, that's a mountaintop experience if ever there was one. Peter, in this retreat time away, is commended for his understanding of who Jesus is. Holidays, times away, can do that, can't they? They can have the effect of helping us to review our lives, to uh, see things more clearly and perhaps recover our sense of priorities and our sense of self. Then it's back to the real world, back to school, back to work, back to the priorities of daily life. Because we read in verse 21, from that time on, Jesus. In some translations it reads, from that time on, Jesus Christ, which might emphasise the continuity of what has just gone on before. But the verse reads, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. The focus has changed. Something has shifted. Things are getting serious. 
Jesus has just predicted his death. Peter, Peter who has been called the rock upon whom Jesus will build his church, Peter who Jesus said is blessed, takes Jesus aside and gives him a talking to. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. It can be understood as a cry from the heart. The Greek allows for it to be translated, No, may God be gracious to you and not let this happen. Or alternatively, God forbid it. But Jesus cuts him off. He turns. Was it to face Peter or did he turn his back on him? And Jesus responds equally forcibly. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The rock on which the church was to be built has now become a rock to stumble over. Peter has understood that Jesus is the Messiah, but he has misunderstood the nature of God's Messiahship. Peter does not at this point grasp that such a calamity could be God's purpose. Just like the tempter, the devil, in chapter 4, who offers Jesus kingship without suffering, so Peter does the same. I have to confess that when I read this passage, my sympathies are with Peter, that impetuous man who loved his friend and understandably didn't want him to suffer or to die. I think that I might have said exactly the same if circumstances were to present themselves. I am often uncomfortable with knowing that Jesus suffered died and rose again for me. As a strategy for evangelism, explaining that whoever wants to follow Jesus must take up their cross is, as St Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 1 23, a stumbling block of its own. Yet, this is how life is with God. Jesus said, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I think that like Peter, It is natural for us to waver between an understanding of seeing God's perspective on the one hand and operating out of a human agenda, which to us may even look like God's agenda on the other. I wonder if sometimes we're so certain of God's concerns that we find it difficult to recognise when our human concerns have taken over. Peter, whilst away with Jesus, recognised him as the Messiah. He was blessed by Jesus and given a sense of status. Almost immediately, Peter is rebuked by Jesus for tempting him to avoid the costs of achieving salvation for the whole world. Only to be immediately caught up in the glory of the transfiguration. I wonder if our Christian lives reflect something of this experience. How many of us will have been away over the summer or can remember holidays and retreats from the past where we have felt a sense, no matter how fleetingly, that we have known God, have experienced God, have understood God's purposes and values? only to follow that with a crushing, 
back to school sense of finding life hard, difficult, tiring. The experience of wanting to avoid or help others avoid the costs of a life that we might have chosen or felt led or called into or have been excited about in the past, but now it feels different. If you recognise this pattern in your life, then you can be encouraged. You are in good company with Peter. Despite his understanding that Jesus was the Messiah, despite his status as the rock on which the church would be founded, Peter faced correction from Jesus. And there are times when we will too. Peter found his life in Christ and after the resurrection of Jesus, he heard once again the call to follow me, to follow Jesus. If we are serious about discipleship, about taking up our cross to follow Jesus, then even though it sounds paradoxical, living or losing our lives for his sake brings life. Because living in the light of the resurrection changes everything. At the beginning of a new academic year, let us seek to follow Jesus. Seek to find our lives in Christ. To live accepting the costs of discipleship and to grow in our understanding of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Just know your will every day. Give us the grace to go on seeking your face in obedience to all that you say. In obedience to all. And so we turn to our prayers. Let us pray. 
Through these prayers, we come with openness to express our concerns for the church and the world to the God of compassion and gracious understanding. Everlasting God, whenever we start to get offended by your generosity or open-mindedness, give us the grace to repent and join your rejoicing. Guard the church against self-righteousness and all rules and limits which you would not own, but keep always before us the rule of love. Creator God, increase in us love, not only for the victims but for the perpetrators of evil and violence in our world, for all governments which run on corruption and fear. We pray for a change of heart and attitude, an awakening to a better way of living and the courage to reject wrong principles. Father God, may our closeness to family and friends make us never exclusive, shutting others out, but always inclusive, welcoming others. Encourage us in outgoing hospitality and keep us from becoming possessive with those we love. Loving God, we pray for all offenders in prison, that on release they will not re-offend, but find enough to support to start a new life in the community. We pray for all who are vulnerable and unable to cope with the demands of life, for alcoholics, drug addicts, and all who are sick in mind. We pray for proper, proper compassionate help for them. Merciful God, we remember those who have died alone, unmourned and unnoticed. We pray for those who've taken their own lives or died in accidents of their own making. We commend them to your merciful love. Faithful God, thank you for helping us to pray. Deepen our loving so that as we pray through this coming week, we may do it with your heart of compassion. And we gather those prayers together with our own as we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. And so as we come to the end of our time together, we pray that you'll have a great week. Enjoy the weather it's not looking great but enjoy whatever this week holds and so a final prayer of blessing may christ draw you to humility and worship and bring you to see god at work and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be with you and remain with you always amen amen we go in peace to love and serve the lord in the name of christ amen have a great week bye-bye